Hey guys, it's Miss Carlson here again. We are going to talk about the tissue level of organization today, which is in chapter four of your textbook. We're really gonna start getting into the meat of AMP now. So some of the content may be a little overwhelming because there are so many new terms and so many pieces to the tissue level, but we will practice in class through lab and you'll have a lot of labeling exercises through your hat pack. So just bear with me and take a break as you need to and make sure you have a good notebook sheet of paper or, or, a, or a Cornell note taking template to take good notes. And let's go ahead and get started. Basically, we're going to talk about four types of tissues today, epithelial, connective, muscular, and neural. And we're going to break each one of those down. Now, it's important to note that our body is made up of trillions of cells, but there's actually only 200 cell types that make up those different types of tissues. So our focus today is to remember that the levels of organization kind of start with the cells, besides getting deeper into that chemical level that we already reviewed this year. And those cells are going to form those tissues that we're going to talk about today, so these main four. And then eventually we will talk about how those tissues combine to form organs and then larger organ systems. So we're going to get the broad general information about each tissue type and then when we start getting into the organs and the organ system specifically, you will hear more about them as well. Alright, so let's first start talking about epithelial tissues. And epithelial tissues are made up of epithelia, which are layers of cells that are exposed to internal and external surfaces. And then there are also glands, which are secreting cells that are derived from these epithelia. Epithelia have some common characteristics. Uh, the cells are bound closely. They are usually free or on an apical surface, meaning something that's exposed on the exterior. And this could be inside or outside the body. They're attached to what we call a basement membrane, which connects them to a connective tissue. They are avascular, meaning they do not have any blood vessels, and they do have the ability to replace and regenerate themselves. Functions of the epithelia include providing physical protection. This keeps them from being abrased, dehydrated, or destroyed. They control permeability, which means they can allow some things to enter and leave. They can also not let anything uh, go in or out at all, which they would be then termed impermeable. They provide sensation by detecting changes in the environment, and they can then uh, pass on that response to neighboring sensory nerves. And finally, they produce specialized secre secretions through gland cells. And there are two different types, exocrine and endocrine. Exocrine excretes to ex um, exterior surfaces, and this could include enzymes, sweat, or milk. And then endocrine releases into surrounding tissues or the blood in the form of a hormone. And we'll talk about those two more here shortly. All right, epithelial cells can have specialized structures known as microvilli or cilia. The microvilli are kind of like a carpet and provide many internal passageways. They, this increases absorption and secretion of that particular type of cell. And you normally find them in the digestive and urinary systems. They specialize in active and passive transport. Uh, because they can provide 20 times the surface area, they can actually provide more access to the plasma membrane, which makes them a more effective way to uh, pass on and remove materials from a cell. Cilia works a little differently, and a typical cell would have about 250 cilia. They are coordinated to move materials across the surface, whether it's taking it away from the cell or bringing it into the cell. Now, a good example of moving something away from the cell would be the ciliated epithelium of the respiratory tract. Uh, it can move mucus-trapped irritants away from the lungs and expel them outside the body through the trachea and esophagus. And here's a picture of the difference between the two. So these are your microvilli. Again, those little projections are able to provide more surface area. And then you also have your longer, more hair-like projections we call cilia. And they, again, are both exposed to the apical surface. Um, and this is the outside exterior portion of the cell. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about that basement membrane. Again, they connect to the body by way of this membrane and are attached to connective tissues. The basement membrane doesn't have any cells, but just basically a network of protein fibers. It provides strength, resists distortion, and restricts movement of proteins and other large molecules. The way that the epithelia are able to renew and repair themselves is because 
they have stem cells or germinative cells near that basement membrane that can continue to replace any cell that is lost due to disruptive enzymes, toxic chemicals, uh, microorganisms, or some kind of mechanical abrasion. All right, epithelia is classified by its cell shape and the layers. So we have two different types of layers and then three different types of shapes. The layers include simple and stratified, and then your shapes are squamous, cuboidal, and columnar, which we are going to talk more about now. So the layers, uh, simple is kind of what it sounds like. It's a single layer. It's thin and fragile, not much mechanical protection, but it is found in protected areas inside the body like the ventral cavities, the heart chambers, and blood vessels. Now, what would be the advantage of being thin? Uh, basically, areas of excretion and absorption, because that layer is thin, it reduces diffusion time and materials are able to diffuse through uh, the inside or to the outside of the body more efficiently. And then you have stratified epithelia, which are several layers. These provide more protection and they're found in areas that encounter frequent mechanical or chemical stress such as the surface of your skin, the linings of your mouth, or the anus. There are three shape types, as I mentioned. Uh, squamous is a plate or scale-like type of epithelial cell. The nucleus is going to occupy the thickest portion of the cell and they kind of look like fried eggs and that was a picture I showed you earlier. Cuboidal, if you were looking at a 3D image of a cuboidal cell, it would look hexagonal, but the typical section view that you'll see will be like a square. The nuclei are generally in the center and they form a neat row as you can see in this picture here. And you can also see that the nuclei take up more of the cell space versus in the uh, squamous epithelial cell. The columnar, they're similar to the cubo cuboidal, but they're taller. Uh, the nuclei are more crowded, and so they're kind of pushed towards the basement membrane, uh, as you can see in this picture here. All right, moving on to the glandular epithelia. They produce secretions, like I said, through the endocrine and exocrine glands. Uh, ducts or tubes are how the exocrine secretions are able to be exposed to the epithelial surface. And then your endocrine, again, are produced... Uh, by ductless glands and they release hormones into blood and tissues. There are three types of exocrine glands and they're classified by their mechanism of secretion or their type of secretion. Uh, Merocrine is the most common. It's released by exocytosis and a good example would be a mucin that is excreted through this process and it will mix with water to form what we call mucus. Uh, mucus can be an effective lubricant, it can be a great protective barrier, it could also be a sticky trap for microorganisms or things we don't want to have in the body. Uh, the apocrine involves loss of cytoplasm and secretory products and uh, one good example would be milk released by a mother after having a child and uh, I'll show you a picture of that in a second. The holocrine cells are actually, uh, or, I'm sorry, the holocrine, holocrine glands will actually have a cell burst and die along with the secretion. Um, a good example would be sebaceous glands, and they're associated with hair follicles, which uh, produce an oily hair coating. And so the cell uh, basically goes along with it and can be reproduced by that basement membrane that contains those stem cells. So merocrine and apocrine glands, the, the, the cells themselves will remain intact after the secretion, but the holocrine cells will not. And here's a picture of your merocrine glands, and you can see the secretory vesicles, uh, the Golgi apparatus is available in the nuclei. Uh, this would be something like a, a lymph node here. Um, your mammary glands actually contain uh, apocrine types of secretions and again the cytoplasm is kind of lost with the release of the secretion and then here's an example of a hair follicle and how the holocrine gland will actually burst and release cytoplasm contents along with the whole entire cell itself and down here is where the stem cells are that can divide and replace those lost cells all right, connective tissues are the next type of tissue we're going to talk about. They're the most diverse in the body. Uh, they're specialized cells that make up connective tissues. Um, extracellular protein fibers uh, are a big part of the makeup. 
There's also a ground substance that's clear colorless fluid along with the fibers to form a matrix and they make, that makes up the uh, volume of the connective tissue. So some characteristics of, tissue, of connective tissues, uh, they're throughout the body, they're not exposed to any surface, and they are highly vascular versus what the epithelial were, so meaning they have a lot of blood vessels. They contain sensory receptors to detect pain, pressure, temperature, and other stimuli. And their functions include support and protection, transportation of materials, uh, storage of energy reserves, and defense of the body. And here are your major types of connective tissue shown in this diagram here. You have three types, connective tissue proper, fluid connective tissues, and supporting connective tissues. So we are gonna talk about each one of those individually and they're each based on their physical properties. Uh, so the cells that make up the connective tissue proper include the fibroblasts, which are the most abundant and produce connective tissue fibers and that ground substance or that fluid we mentioned. Macrophages are scattered throughout the matrix and they will phagocytize damaged cells, pathogens by releasing chemicals that mobilize the immune system. Fat cells, which are also known as adipocytes, they are permanent residents and again they kind of provide that cushion, that protection and the number of them will vary depending on where that connective tissue is in the body. And then finally we have mast cells. Uh, they're small mobile cells found near blood vessels. Uh, they'll help fight off injury and infection. Uh, so we also have connective tissue fibers. Uh, one type of fiber is a collagen fiber. It's long, straight, and unbranched. It is the most flexible type, most common type. And then you also have elastic fibers which contain protein of elastin. They are branched and wavy and can stretch and return to its original length, which elastic is in the name, so we can kind of lend ourselves to knowing that about the elastic fibers. There are also reticular fibers, and I'll kind of remind you of the reticulum uh, prefix suffix that we learned about. And so it's just a network of fibers. They're the same protein, they're made up of the same protein as collagen, but they're just in a different arrangement, so they're hard to tell the difference in the image they show in the textbook but they do form branching and interwoven frameworks for organs. Okay, so here's that image from your textbook that I was talking about with the cells and the fibers of the connective tissue proper. Without the coloring, it's kind of hard to tell the reticular fiber uh, from the elastic fiber, but the elastic fibers are longer where the reticular fibers are a little bit shorter. And again, they have that network of woven fibers together. Here are some uh, fat cells or adipocytes. You have your, um, macrophage here, um, mast cell, and then your collagen fiber is kind of like the thicker fiber that they show like in a yellowish orange color. All right, there are multiple types of connective tissue proper. There's loose or connective, and the loose are like the packing materials of the body. There's more ground substance but fewer fibers in this type of connective tissue proper. They provide cushion. And then your dense is tough, strong, and durable. Resist tension and distortion. And is interconnected with the bone and the muscles. Your fluid connective tissues involve blood and lymph. Um, and watery matrix of dissolved proteins is what makes up the majority of this type of connective tissue. In blood, we actually call that a watery matrix plasma. And then you will also find the formed elements of blood in the fluid connective tissue. Uh, RBCs is one of them, or red blood cells. They carry oxygen to tissues. White blood cells will support our immune system. And then you also have platelets that will help with blood clotting. Supportive connective tissue includes the cartilage and the bone. Uh, cartilage is a gel-like ground substance. It's like a, works as a shock absorber and it helps protect. And then your bone is calcified, which, and it's made up of uh, rigid calcium salts and minerals, and it provides weight support and, of course, our structural support of our body. So we have several different types of cartilage. Uh, that includes the hyaline cartilage, the elastic cartilage, and the fibrocartilage. And you will practice uh, labeling these and identifying the locations and functions of each in your hat pack. But just real quick, the hyaline cartilage provides stiff but somewhat flexible support. 
They usually reduce friction uh, between the bony surfaces. The elastic provides support but tolerates distortion so it can go back to its original form. And then the fibrocartilage will resist compression and prevents bone to bone contact um, and limits that to some extent. Okay, so your textbook does a good job of showing you a diagram that compares cartilage versus bone. For example, cartilage cells are chondrocytes versus bone cells, which are osteocytes. They show you the, the ground substance is made of a protein poly polysaccharide gel and water for cartilage, whereas with bone, it's a small volume of liquid surrounding insoluble crystals of calcium salts, which makes it obviously more rigid. Uh, then it compares the fibers, vascularity or blood supply, and also some metabolic features. So if you can identify visually the difference between cartilage and bone, you're in a pretty good spot right now. Um, this is what bone would look like underneath the microscope. It shows the lacunae, which are just a small pit in, the, in, that, uh, in that piece of bone. And the osteo osteocytes actually are found in that lacunae. Okay, moving on to tissue membranes and their physical barriers. There are four different types of tissue membranes now. So there's mucus, serous, cutaneous, and synovial, and we're going to talk about each one, of course. Okay, so mucus membranes are also known as mucosae. They line the cavities that communicate with the exterior. They keep epithelial surfaces moist. And the areolar tissue portion is called the laminae propriae. They look like this, and mucous membranes are coated with the secretions of mucus. And the membranes usually line the digestive, respiratory, urinary, and reproductive tracts. The serous membranes line cavities not open to the exterior. They're thin and strong. They have fluid transundate to reduce friction, so basically like a fluid barrier. Uh, the parietal portion is what covers the cavity, and then the viscera or serosa portion covers the organ itself. So there are three types of serous membranes. There are pleura, which lines the pleural cavity and covers the lungs. There's a peritoneum that lines the peritoneal cavity and covers the liver and stomach. And finally, you have the pericardium that lines the pericardial cavity and covers the heart. And here's a picture of the serous membrane. Again, lines the ventral body cavities that we just mentioned, pleural, peritoneal, and the pericardial. And you can notice how they are much thinner and flatter compared to the mucous membrane. All right, cutaneous, it is the skin itself. It covers the surface of the body and it's thick, waterproof, and dry. So when we're looking at the cutaneous membrane or the skin, it covers the outer surface. It's made up of epithelium, the areolar tissue, and dense irregular connective tissues. Now, synovial uh, membranes, they line moving or articulating joint cavities. They produce synovial fluid, which provides a lubricant uh, that protects and aids, uh, provides smooth movement of those joints. And then uh, synovial membranes actually lack true epithelium they're primarily made up of areolar tissue, which is just a loose, irregular connective tissue. I know I've mentioned it a couple of times. Now, uh, synovial fluid can, like I said, lines joint cavities and produces fluid. And in your knee, it's, it's kind of in between um, your articular cartilage. And again, provides that kind of cushion and helps with movement. All right, muscle tissues, second to last tissue type we're gonna talk about. There are three types of muscle tissues, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth, and they are shown in order in these pictures up here. So this is your skeletal, this is your cardiac, and this is your smooth. Basically, the purpose of the muscle tissues is to interact between myosin and actin protein filaments to provide movement in the body in some capacity. Uh, skeletal tissues are very large, multinucleated cells, and they're usually called muscle fibers. They will appear very striated, as you saw in the picture, because of that repeating uh, grouping of actin and myosin. And movement is stimulated by nerves. Uh, cardiac is found, found only in the heart. It is also striated, but smaller cells and only one nuclei. The movement for this type of tissue is going to be the contractions that the heart makes in different areas of the heart. 
and the pacemaker cells are what regulate the rate of these contractions, uh, not any kind of stimulus. Uh, finally, there is smooth that's found in the walls of blood vessels uh, around hollow organs such as the urinary bladder, and they are primarily found around the respiratory, digestive, and reproductive tracts. All of them, again, are responsible for contractions and producing all of our body movement. Okay, so the last tissue we're going to talk about is the neural tissue, which primary job is to respond to stimuli and conduct electrical impulses. The, it's concentrated in the brain and the spinal cord, so 98% of this type of tissue is found in those areas there to process information and control response and also rapidly sense internal and external environment. So we're going to break down the different parts of this tissue, which is made up of mainly neurons. And the neurons are made up of the axon, uh, the cell body itself, and then the dendrites that kind of look like tree branches. So. Like I just mentioned, one of the two types of neural cells that make up the neural tissue are the neurons. They communicate between results in conscious and unconscious thought processes. They communicate through electrical events, and they are the longest cells in your body. And they're made up of those three parts that I just showed you in the picture, the cell body, the dendrites, and the axon. There's also the neuroglia, that's the other type of neural cell. It provides physical support for the neural tissue, maintains chemical composition of the neural tissue fluids, and then also will supply nutrients to the neurons and defend the tissue from infection. Now, tissue injury and repair, we would normally see two different things happening, inflammation and then regeneration. And we're just going to talk briefly about those two processes because they are, they are involved in maintaining homeostasis. Inflammation is the first response to injury, uh, produces familiar signs that we may know of in getting injured, swelling, heat, redness, and pain. They're triggered by impact, abrasion, chemical irritation, infection, or extreme temperatures. And then the second phase of the injury response would then be regeneration if possible, depending on the tissue type. But uh, fibroblasts usually produce dense networks of fibers, which build up scar tissue or also called fibrous tissue that can be kind of changed over time. But usually you can see scar tissue uh, separate from the original epithelial or whatever type of cell you're replacing. All right, uh, four nine aging tissues is the topic of this one. And basically, with age, the rate of tissue repair declines and your cancer rate increases. Uh, tissue repair is due to slow rate of energy consumption, hormonal alterations, and then reduced physical activity that decrease that rate of tissue repair. Cancer rate will increase. Uh, simply because of environmental exposure to chemicals and, of course, cigarette smoke is a big cause of many cancers. And there's other uh, types of cancer that we're not sure why. But one-fourth of the people in the U.S. US develop cancer. That's 25% of Americans. And it is the number two cause of death, so very important to be aware of. And this is one of the reasons why we do study uh, tissues so frequently. All right, so make sure, again, you know those prefixes and suffixes on page 91, the key terms for this chapter on page 115, which I know there was quite a bit. So uh, try not to feel overwhelmed. We'll practice in class. We'll, we'll work with these uh, new terms and different components and parts of each type of tissue in class, and hopefully that will get you more familiar with them. All right, uh, post any questions on that discussion, and I'll see you in class.